Midterm polls signal a possible red wave due to Democrats' poor ratings on the state of the economy and rising inflation. Pundits often claimed elect the election would be a referendum on the Biden presidency and thus a Republican landslide. While results are still slowly coming in this morning, it appears the grand old party is not performing as well as expected. Democrats overcame 76 percent of voters rating the economy negative, uh, according to an ABC exit poll. Support for abortion rights, negative views of Donald Trump, rejection of election denial, broad backing from young voters and surprising strength among independents. Uh, that all had important impact. So what changed? Joining us now to break all this down is advisor at De Decision Desk HQ, Scott Tranter. Welcome, Scott. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. So help us, you know, explain what's happening. It looks to me like, uh, you know, a lot of the polls had very close races and these are close races. So I don't think, and I'm, I'm curious to get your take on this. Obviously, I, it doesn't seem to me like we're seeing massive polling error, although to the extent there is polling error, it's, it's in the, it's in the, positive for the Democrats. Democrats are doing a little bit better than the polls suggested, which is obviously not what we've seen in the last uh, in the last election cycle. Uh, help, help break it all down for us. Yeah, no, I think I think you're on to something. If we look at the last three election cycles, 2020, 2018, 2016, the polling error has been um, uh, in the favor of the Republicans. Um, there's still a lot of races to call and a lot of polls to uh, analyze. But from what we've seen so far, the polling error has seemed to undercount Democrats, specifically in Pennsylvania, potentially in Georgia, um, and we're waiting to see Arizona and Nevada play out. But when we look at the House races, there is a very real chance that Democrats are able to hold on to the House, which uh, 24 hours ago was about a 15 to 20 percent chance. Uh, how much of this is a kind of a Bradley effect, where people polled don't necessarily want to confess their true opinions, uh, specifically around the issue of abortion? Because we heard a lot of talk about how abortion just didn't rank for voters when it came to the economy and inflation and crime, that those were the priorities that were going to drive people to the polls. Obviously, we saw in Kansas that abortion had the ability to drive turnout. Are we not looking at this the right way? Is it Could it be the case that either voters didn't want to necessarily say that abortion was a priority or didn't really think of it as a priority, but it was a uh, necessary but in, you know not in, necessary but insufficient thing that drives them to the polls, right? That it was something that was going to get them to the polls even if it wasn't a stated priority because of how important it was as a foundational tool. How, how are you looking at the intersection between the pri poll pri polling priorities and the role abortion played last night? I, I'd be lying if you said if I said I had any definitive answers on that. That is one of the one of two leading theories on why um, some of the polling may have missed under 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 uh, basically undercounting, under catching how important abortion, abortion was. Um, the other theory is, is candidates matter, right? So there's there quite a few Trump backed candidates um, and, and those candidates did not do well despite being Republican and despite being in favorable um, generic Republican uh, a wave year. Um, you know, so between those two issues, there's going to be a lot of brand new, newly minted PhDs as they look at the exit polling and they mm -hmm. and the dust settles on this and try and figure out what uh, what the miss was here. Mm. Speaking of PhDs, I'm kind of curious to ask then about the role that you, that student debt may or may not have played in this. I saw um, a prominent student debt group tweeting critically of Tim Ryan. He, of course, lost his race uh, and was a, an opponent of student debt cancellation, vocally so, at the same time that youth vote really helped push a lot of Democratic candidates over the edge who were successful last night. What role do you think uh, Biden's promises of student debt cancellation as yet fulfilled, uh, as yet unfulfilled rather, uh, had on last night's results? I think it's going to play out and let's see what it looks like in Arizona and Nevada, which has also a decent amount of, of folks with, who are holding student debt. Um, Tim Ryan in Ohio um, made it close near the end. He is he's going to ultimately lose by several points. Um, and, and student debt certainly play, played an issue there in the in the 18 to 34 crowd, um, which we did see in the exit polling did did did, did matter. Um, you know, well, let's see what it looks like in suburban Georgia and some of these more suburban college areas, um, how it plays out. But that combined with abortion, combined with polling misses uh, on the Democratic side, uh, you have a mix for not a red wave, a red ripple.
I, I did see a lot of uh, kind of conservatives concluding that while J.D. Vance you know, ha did win, uh, did beat Tim Ryan, the, the amount of money spent in that race to achieve that result, money that could have been spent, could have been spent on Masters, could have been spent on Laxall. We don't you know, quite know, obviously, what's going to happen in Nevada. Could have been spelled better used elsewhere if they didn't have to defend um, in, in Ohio. Uh, so th there's a, a kind of, uh, you know, anger there, kind of, the, you know, the implication being that even though that candidate won, uh, because he put the, the Republicans in the position of having to defend it or spend money there, spend resources there, it hurt them elsewhere. Are, are, you, are, do you, are you seeing that argument being, being made as well? Absolutely, and it's certainly logical. But I think this, if, uh, if the campaign strategists knew exactly how much to spend so they could get exactly the number of votes they needed and not one more, um, first of all, these guys would be buying lottery tickets, not necessarily yeah. advising campaigns. Um, but that, that's easy because money's fungible. One thing I would point out is in 2020 and now in 2022, we've had record setting fundraising across the board. And while money gets you to a certain level, at a certain point, it's diminishing returns. Once you've got enough money, you got it. Um, after that, there are diminishing returns. And I think we saw that in Ohio. Um, I, I, I happen to think Blake Masters had enough money down the stretch. It wasn't a money problem. It's just going to be a message problem. Um, mm. And that's kind of what we're learning. Just because you have the most money doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're a guaranteed win. It's not like it was 20, 30 years ago. It also seems to have hurt some of APAC's candidates. I talked about this in a radar last week, but Summer Lee uh, was targeted by APAC in her primary, where they backed her primary opponent, and then they got into the race in the general election for the first time, putting money behind a Republican candidate who also was unsuccessful in their effort to beat uh, Summer Lee. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, I want to ask you though, how much, there was this last minute push we saw from Barack Obama on the campaign tra trail and some others who seemed to take the advice that was coming from the left flank of the party, Bernie Sanders and the like, to talk more about the economy and to talk about the Republican plan to address inflation, which has been as it articulated to cut Social Security and Medicare. Do you think people concerned about those kind of bedrock retirement programs um, had any effect on this race or was that kind of too little too late after the bed was, uh, bread was baked? Well, it's interesting you point that out, at least, you know, because you've got some of these candidates on, on, on the trail saying they're not going to cut Medicare, they're not going to cut Social Security. But then when you actually do the issue polling and ask the voters what they think and what they think may not be reality, but what they think, you know, is their reality at the moment, it's a mixed bag there. So I do think it does have an effect, especially if you're 50 or older, which tends to be the demographic that votes quite a bit more. Um, that message was pushed quite a bit down the stretch. But in states like Arizona, Florida, um, Nevada, um, there had already been a significant amount of vote already voted. So I think mm -hmm. it's a mixed bag on, bag on where that where, where Social Security and Medicare um, uh, stood there. But, you know, it is not necessarily a clean win for the Republicans because they're going to tell you every day we're not going to cut it. But the voters don't necessarily believe that. Speaking of having already voted, uh, you know, we've discussed uh, the, the, you know, the libertarian vote is a factor in Arizona and in Georgia. In Georgia, you know, likely to ma making it certainly more likely to head to a recount. And then in Arizona, the Libertarian Party candidate had dropped out and endorsed the Republican Blake Masters, which is something we covered on the show last week. However, he was still on the ballot despite doing that. And I see him getting uh, here, it looks like he's getting over 2% of the vote. So could you, you talk a little bit about uh, you know, what's, uh, what, what's happened with third parties so far? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Third parties, the libertarian candidates, especially in, in places like Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, there's one in, in Florida, that one didn't necessarily matter. Um, they tend to pull in high single digits and they tend to end up getting one to two points when it's all said and done. Um, so, you know, they basically perform under where they poll, um, which usually doesn't have an impact. But when we're looking at Georgia, where Warnock is, you know, 20, 30,000 votes potentially away from avoiding a runoff, it could it could matter. Um, and especially in Arizona, where it's too close to say whether, you know, that candidate's going to matter or not, uh, that libertarian candidate, it's certainly a possibility and it's going to be talked about. I think that Georgia one's the most interesting. I was looking at that right before I came in here, and that's where I'm going to go look at right when I'm done. We're waiting for some votes out of Atlanta, and that will tell us whether or not there's enough for Warnock um, to get above 50 or not. I suspect there's probably not. Um, and it's that libertarian candidate that's keeping uh, Walker in it. Hmm. Well, Scott, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. More rising right after this.